My name is Bruce Campbell. I, um, I want to welcome you all to uh, the last uh, session of this uh, incredible start to the conference uh, on aligning finances to the new climate reality. Um, and uh, I'm honored uh, to be uh, moderating and introducing Senator Rosa Galvez, who will talk. Uh, I will introduce myself first. Uh, very briefly, I'm not uh, um, okay, Roy. Um, so Bruce Campbell is my name. Um, I'm on the executive of the Group of 78. I'm former executive director of the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. I have an adjunct professorship at York University in the Faculty uh, of Environmental and Urban Change, and. Uh, uh, I'm a visiting fellow at the Center for Free Expression at, at the Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly Ryerson. So that's it for me. Um, and I'm privileged to be welcoming uh, Senator Galvez uh, to speak today um, on um, and uh, and uh, uh, she will she will talk about her. Uh, her, all she has done. She's done amazing work uh, in the Senate since she's been there. It's been six years, I think, um, and um, especially on aligning uh, finance uh, with climate commitments. Uh, uh, the the uh, the work, and she'll tell you about how it came about and the white paper that was created. And in March of this year. Uh, her introduction, her tabling of Bill uh, Bill 243, uh, Climate Aligned Finance Act legislation to help align Canada's financial sector in its transition to a net zero economy. Uh, so that's the focus uh, of, of her talk. I'll say a few words about Senator Alves. I could say a lot of words. Um, uh, she's an, uh, an independent senator from Quebec and the president of the Parliamentary Network on Climate Change of Parle Americas. She is an environmental engineer and was a professor at Laval University in Quebec for over 25 years. Uh, she's one of Canada's leading experts in pollution control, water and wastewater treatment, watershed management, sustainable development, in municipal and hazardous waste, site remediation, impact assessment and climate risk to infrastructure. Uh, at the Senate, she's a member of the Standing Committee uh, on National Finance, the Senate uh, Standing Committee on Energy, Environment and Natural Resources, which she chaired during the 42nd Parliament. In 21, 2021, she was the sponsor of the Senate uh, in the Senate of the Canada Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act, providing an accountability framework for the Canadian federal government to achieve its net zero emissions goal by 2050. She was a recipient of the Clean 50 Award 2021 for her parliamentary work on climate and the environment. And I'm, I'm especially honored to have this opportunity to introduce Senator Galvez, our relation goes back to the Lac uh, Megantic rail disaster in July 6, 2013. She was there on that apocalyptic night. Um, her in-depth and independently funded research on health environment, and the environmental impact uh, of the disaster and her critique of transporting volatile oil by rail and conventional oil or inspirational in my own research and book on the Lac Megantic. So, Senator Galvez, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bruce. Thank you so much, Roy. Um, thank you so much for you being here present today to talk and have this conversation, this long due conversation about finances, the climate, the inequality and uh, to debate about our existing economic model and see if this economic model is still work for us as a society. Um, so we'll start with my presentation. 
Yes, thank you. So I want to present you my um, the evolution on my the thinking in my office and the groups that I that I meet in order to align our economy, our financial system with our um, climate commitments. Next. Okay, so as we just finished discussing and arguing and debating, the state of our economy, our environment, our society is um, it's at a very low point. And uh, there are multiple reasons, multiple factors, because especially in particularly with respect to the environment, that we are in this situation, in this daring situation with, with having climate change um threatening the existence of our society as we know it okay so we can continue to study in silos the problem of overpopulation or we can always blame engineers like me and say you haven't developed yet all the possibilities of technology uh, but we can also look at our economic model and you know and and say it uh, with normality, without uh, um, without uh, starting wars, that our economic linear economic model has failed to us, and that we should be rendering this model more circular. And uh, and of course, there are other um, other reasons. Uh, click, please click. Okay, so we need to change the parad um, paradigm of studying and analyzing and debating things in silo and start making more like a global holistic analysis of what's going on. And this has to be informed to the population. So like everybody has the same type of information. And so we don't have just a specific lenses. Let's say, for example, to use the what my previous um, um, presenter said about just looking it from the economic, from the finance point of view, we have to look at from many points of view and bring together more creative solutions and maybe go back to some values that used to be very important in our society, such as solidarity and cooperation. And uh, yes, it's true, we need to go and continue with competition, but not only competition. You know, so we have to um, we have to change this paradigm. So we used to call it a market economy, and we have become a market society. So unfortunately, unfortunately, this model has become with a lot of externalities. The industries and the corporations are needed to produce um, products, but also to create jobs. But they have created in parallel a lot of pollution that is called externality. And this externality, yes, can create some other jobs. Like, for example, I think when they created the recycling industry, well, they created a whole sector to get rid of some of the plastic waste that we were generating. But today we know that that didn't end up well because our waste, the plastic, is sent to... Uh, developing countries or is it floating in the big plastic patch in the Pacific? So the, at the end, what is incredibly important is to understand that from 100% of natural resources that we, that we take from nature, we use only between 10 and 20% and the rest goes to garbage. The rest ends up as emissions in the atmosphere creating the problem of climate change ends up in plastic, microplastic, including in our bodies. We have today in our bodies microplastics. End up in the fruits and the vegetable we consume in the form of residues of pesticides. And so therefore, we are not living sustainable. And we are using, uh, overshooting the, um, the resources of the planet per year in less than one year. So Canada, for example, we overshoot in the month of March. Doesn't tell us that a lot of how grown are things. You know, the average for the planet is in June. So we are in March. So we are really, really using it and wasting our natural resources. So this is terrifying. 
Next click, please. So we have to change this model that takes, makes, use, and dispose to make it in a more circular economy. So like any new product that arrives to our homes can be reused, recycled, degraded, or otherwise taken away from the uh, from circulation. That should be the uh, the idea. And I am happy with the digitalization and the uh, uh, epoch, the digitalization movement. Of course, you know that it's equivalent to dematerializing. We don't need to have also many CDs and DVDs and these. But we can have all of that in the in the, our computer or in whatever um, appliance we have. But those computers, those telephones, those needs to be able to be repaired. So again, if it cannot be repaired or recycled or reused, they should disappear because otherwise it ends up in the landfills. It ends up in the in the air or it ends up in oceans or in developing countries. I can tell you that having lived in Montreal, I'm, I'm so sad to say that the landfill in Montreal who received all the landfill has been obtaining and obtaining permissions to expand and expand and expand to a point in which the structure of the landfill is now in danger, in risk. And we have to close this, this landfill. And this situation is not only for Montreal, it's everywhere. Because as Canadians, we produce several kilos of waste per capita. And the same thing for energy. We say that um, the energy, um, uh, we know we can take a picture of the, uh, of the uh, energy consumption in the world. We can take a picture and we can say, oh, okay, so the emissions are caused by China, by Brazil, by India. But that's a picture of today. If instead we decide to take a film and look into when we started this industrial revolution and we end up today, we will see that Canadians, we consume a lot of energy per capita, which is the double or the triple of what is consumed in other countries. Like, for example, even countries that are at the same latitude as Canada, like Norway. You compare how much the Norway or the um, the uh, Scandinavian countries use per capita on energy, you will see that we use more than them. So the issue of being in a latitude where we need more energy is not necessarily true. So we need to um, address this problem of externalities and we should really apply with law that is enshrined in law, but is not implemented in practice, the polluters pays principle. So every bill says that polluters must pay. But show me where is this? Where is this implemented? Next. So, uh, next. Okay. So in 2009, this group of very, very intelli um, intelligent and smart um, um, scientists in the Scandinavian world came out with this um, information to us that says that our planet, which is unique, is the only home that we know. There is no planet B. We, this is our, um, our shuttle, our home that is surrounding the Milky Way. It's governed by physical, biological laws, most of which we cannot change. So if it will be easy to make a chemical uh, reaction to transform the CO2 uh, that is in the atmosphere, uh, it will be solved. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. We don't have that. And gravity exists too. And so we are ruled by physical, mechanical, biological laws. And so they came with this model of the planet functioning and operating because there are nine systems, critical and basic, that makes the life in Earth habitable for human life. And so which are these systems is, for example, the nutrient cycles, 
where nitrogen and phosphorus they circulate in the uh, in the earth. Um, they have the issue with climate change. Very, very important equilibrium between the concentration of oxygen, nitrogen, CO2, too, in the atmosphere. But we, in the Industrial Revolution, in a very, very small time, we have passed from 200 ppm of CO2 equivalent to 400 ppm. So if you want to know in practical what is the feeling of going from 200 to 400, I can give you this as an example. If you take a decaffeinated coffee, it has a concentration of 200 ppm. If you take a caffeinated normal coffee, it has a concentration of 400 ppm of caffeine. So for sure, you know what it feels to take a decaffeinated coffee with a caffeinated one. We feel the ball, the energy, the kick, of the caffeine it is the same thing. How can we think that putting the double of concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is not going to have any effect? In which type of head that can fit in? It's impossible. Acid acidification of oceans. So this CO2 is absorbed in the oceans. The oceans go acidic and then they destroy the corai and the bio. Uh, and, uh, and the life in the oceans. Biodiversity, these are all nine mechanisms that makes possible human life uh, in Earth. Next. Later, after this, after uh, the scientists look at these processes, there were economies uh, with um, uh, Robert in 2012 that start thinking that Yes, we are in this situation of a linear economy, very predatory capitalism, uh, overshooting the resources of planet Earth. So they came with this other model that says that, of course, we all humans need dignity in living and we need to have access to justice, to clean water, to clean earth, to clean soil for our food. And uh, this is the floor that for dignity and human right um, reasons, every citizen in the planet must have. But on the other extreme, we cannot overshoot what planet Earth gives us. I don't know if you're aware that um, more than 70% of GDP is based on natural capital. It comes from natural resources. So if we want to have our economy going, we better care for nature because nature is the one providing for this GDP that we all live for because that's the indicators that politicians has make us, you know, accept as the indicator of well-being when it is not. Because when I look at my living, and I'm sure you too, when you look at how do you live, you, you agree with me that it's not the money only. It's your health, it's your education, it's the access to clean water, etc., etc. Okay, so there is this donut where we have the possibility for creation, for developing that and um, showing how um, ingenuity of the human being can be by developing models that works within these limits. Next. So, COVID arrived, and COVID is also an, another result of what we are doing to the planet. If you talk to doctors, they will tell you this, okay? So, there is 300 coronavirus that have potential to jump into the human. And uh, what happened with COVID, it was just a tragedy to waiting to happen. So they knew, everybody knew, but again, like the 2008, uh, everybody knew, but nobody did anything. So COVID arrived and stopped us. So COVID didn't destroy the system. It just revealed that our system was broken. And it gave us a lot of time to reflect. So I reflect, my team reflect, and I take advantage of presenting you, Stefan LaViolette, from my team. Um, 
we 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 are known at the Senate as a, a small think tank, and we start realizing that you know these things are ten, are interlinked, and that extreme weather events are happening. I told you I'm an engineer. I'm, I worry about climate change. Extreme weather events comes impacts infrastructure. Sometimes it destroys them, but most of the time it doesn't destroy them completely. But it renders them more vulnerable. And the next time that the hurricane, the tornado, or the flood will come, they won't resist as if they were new. They are more vulnerable. Health impacts, economic costs, and equal impacts. So now every year we have extreme weather events that are very destructive. Who's paying that cost? So people are telling me, oh, it's half the province, half the federal. And when I ask the province, the province says, we pay some, the municipalities pay a lot more. So it's the municipalities that are at the front of these things that are happening. And every year is worse. And every year we are having more than 1 billion per extreme weather event destruction. Next. So the other thing that we were looking at into it is this, you know, we I'm becoming familiar with the term double materiality, which is the following, is that this destruction of extreme weather events of infrastructure, this fact that the technology is changing and that we can have now solar, wind, um, hydro, nuclear, biomass, uh, renewable energy is competing with the business as usual fossil fuels and is creating a stranded assets. And a stranded asset is an infrastructure that went unusable before the end of its expected lifetime. And so the banks are scared and are worried about this risk on their investment in their lendings. But at the same time, as this graph shows, is our banks are massively investing in fossil fuels. So on one hand, they are scared of what this represents and this risk that is increasing. But on the other hand, they are feeding the climate crisis. This is called double materiality. Some financial institutions accept it and, and, and are working and are trying to solve this issue, but, but others still try to deny it. So we, we came, as previous speaker also mentioned, with this news that you can put all members of boards in a room with 500 people. So you have members of boards of pension plans, banks, fossil fuels in the same room. And so now the big question is how a member of a board of a bank will have the same perception and opt fiduciary duties as somebody that sits in a pension plan because I see young people here, they are contributing to the pension and they are going to claim their pension only in 30 years. But maybe in 30 years, there won't be any more fossil fuels, hopefully, and there will be just, you know, solar panels and big batteries. So who is going to pay for that? So the fiduciary duties, depending on which board you are sitting, are completely different. And uh, and if you are sitting at the same time in these two boards, what you should be declaring that you are in conflict of interest or at least in an appearance of a friction. Next. So we start writing down all these reflections and we publish a book, um, a white paper on the recovery and a clean recovery and a just transition after the COVID pandemic. You. I invite you all to find my web page and you will find these documents and, and many others. But we had the opportunity to make recommendations to the government, which was very receptive because we saw in the uh, budget um, right after almost the end of the pandemic, some of the recommendations that we put in this first uh, white paper. Next. But also these um, realization that, you know, I am an engineer, I come from the science uh, sector. And for 
more than 20 years, we engineers, professors are being teaching our engineer students that we are in the transition. And yet in Canada, this transition is absent, it's stagnant. It's, it's not moving. So we need to accelerate this decarbonization. We need to make the things happening. The science did their job. They prove that is the burning of fossil fuels. The engineers have done their job. They have produced a scalable, cheaper, renewable um, technology. The citizen, if you read the polls, more than 70% of Canadians are in favor of a climate action, accelerated climate action. So what is missing? And when you look at that, you conclude that the piece in the machine that is not moving is the financial machine. The cash flows are not going into which they are because of all what just told you before, which is that we are in a linear just for profit economy. So, of course, do you think the oil and gas are going to say, okay, I shut down? No. Why they will do that when they know that solar and wind and tidal and uh, biomass doesn't need to pay fuel to be burned? So, in the price of energy, you have price of energy equal to a speculation in geopolitics plus the cost of the fuel that you're going to burn plus the operation cost of the of the plant that is generating the generating electricity plant so when you come to renewables the factor of geo the of geopolitics and speculation is almost nil the price the cost for the fuel is zero because we don't need this we don't need oil and and gas and so what it remains is what is very important which is the work the jobs and producing a cheap electricity to everybody and rendering the nation's independent energy, energy independent. So all of these can be found in this second uh, white paper that we wrote. Next. So we wanted to imitate what the government does to get uh, uh, legislation. We consulted with a lot of people. We have hundreds of people and uh, um, experts, international, national, and we came with a list of recommendations. Um, all of this was facilitated by the uh, Trottier Foundation and the um, Concordia University um, uh, Sustainable uh, Finances Group, and we developed uh, a tool, a legislative tool, which is what uh, I want to present you now. Next. So CAFA, for short, is the um, is the Climate Aligned Finance Act, and it has two big parts. One uh, one part where we can see um, uh, six uh, items, which is the action points, is what that the the bill actually does. And part two, in which is like the the cuisine, is the 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 homework, is the the cook the cooking part that we need absolutely to do to in order to make it possible that these six action points uh, work. And, uh, and other parts of the bill that includes coming into force and review. Next. Okay, so what does my bill does? My bill wants to establish within the fiduciary duty tells to, um, to every financial regulated institution that they have to align with climate commitments. So I am not telling you anything new. You know that Canada has national and international climate commitments. Now, so far, Canada has not attained any of its uh, climate commitments. So we have laws, but there is no law to implement the law. So what my bill does is pushes to implement it. And actually, it activates Section 23 of the um, um, Net Zero um, Accountability Act because it puts the pressure on financial uh, finance minister to act. So we want to make it very clear in the fiduciary duties 
that directors must align with climate commitment. We want that the officer for and uh, uh, office of superintendent financial institutions to develop guidelines to tell all these institutions how to develop the roadmaps to net zero and the progress, how to tell us what is the progress. As I said just uh, before, you know, we cannot wait until 249 to start making efforts to reduce our emissions. Um, so it will obligate to these institutions to prepare action plans, targets, science-based targets, reports, meeting these climate commitments. And uh, it will also bring two expertise that right now are missing in the decision boards, which is climate change, the science of climate change, which indirectly and directly impacts the expertise on energy. I think I'm not saying anything new when I tell you that in Canada, most of the time when you talk about energy, the first reaction of people is to equate it with fossil fuels. When in reality today, energy could be equated with so many other things, solar, wind, biomass, nuclear, um, hydro, tidal, uh, wave. So it is big time we think outside the box. Um, so we also, as I mentioned it, we want that the other ministers are implicated because we know now that Minister of Environment has done its possible, Minister of Natural Resources have done its possible, but it is now the role of the finances to come and play their critical role in moving the machine of decarbonization. Next. So also why we have to move in that direction is because the rest of the world is going in that direction. And if we don't move now quickly at the pace at which these other big jurisdictions of developed countries does, so we will lie behind. We are already behind. So the EU, um, European Central Bank is doing things. They have a green taxonomy. They are moving. The U.S. Securities Exchange Commission already is saying you have to disclose mandatory climate risks for your activities. You have to decarbonize. You have now the, um, the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act. And so if we don't move, we will be left behind. So for all those reasons, the tool at my disposal is legislation. And so I tabled this uh, bill March um, this year. It's in the Senate. We are studying. But to be very honest with you, we need the pressure of all of you. So it's very interesting for me because having in, been in this field for 47 years of my life, I could say that at this point, I would be depressed, but I'm not on the contrary. I'm very positive. And why I'm saying this is because there is no week, there is no month, there is no year, there is that a new group comes and approaches me and says, we are, we are with you. How do we help you? And what do we do? So I have retirees for the environment, grannies for the environment, doctors for the environment, nurses for the environment, workers for the environment, which didn't exist 10 years ago. So I think that when Paul says that 70% of Canadians wants this, they are really right. They are the young, the youth, all this movement and, and nationally. Now, if I go international, as Bruce mentioned, I am the president of the network on climate change for the Parliamericas, which is all the parliaments of all the nations in the, the three Americas. So I, I think that we have the mass, but now we need to have also the plan on how to impact and ask um, accountability from our politicians. So thank you very much. And uh, if you have any question or comment, I'm very happy to hear it. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Senator Gavavez, um, for this, um, well, 
for your presentation, but for the for the legislation itself. Um, I I have I have many questions. I expect there will be questions uh, from from the floor. I mean, I'm encouraged when you you know that the, of your optimism that there is a groundswell of activism uh, that is that is moving this forward, and I'm interested. You know, as you as you mentioned, Canada is a is a laggard with respect to putting commitments uh, into action. I mean, it's its uh, signature reaction is inaction. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering, um, first of all, um, well, maybe you can, maybe you can give us a sense of where, what the timeline is of the legislation, but also I'd be interested uh, in um, you, you, your, your action plan and uh, it, it involves uh, changes in legislation for the Bank of Canada, for OS, the, uh, the, uh, the OSFI, the uh, Superintendent of Financial Institutions, Environment and Climate Change, and so forth and so forth. And I'm wondering, have you had a reaction from Finance Canada? Have you had a reaction from OSFI? Um, yes. Are they, are they um, I, I, I think I read a, a, a media report which said the Finance Canada would respond in due course, unquote. Yes. What does that mean? You, you are right to be worried about that. And there is um, um, a resistance of acting, and um, but there is no resistance in recognizing the problems. So we haven't met... We, we have met with everybody, with the banks, with insurance, with the uh, pension plans, with the uh, with OSFI. We have met with everybody, and uh, uh, so far, nobody has says your assessment of the situation is wrong. Nobody, absolutely nobody, has said that. So everybody agrees on the diagnostics, and so I will say, you know, okay, so you are the doctor, and you are diagnosed. Uh, making the diagnostic of a patient that has uh, lung cancer due to too much smoking. So when or what do you tell to the patient? Are you going to let him, the patient there forever, lying with its cancer until he dies? You have to act. So that, that diagnostics is not enough. So of course, the next question is, so what are you doing? And so we see that they have plans but that these plans are so snail progressing and, and it's not, um, they are not ambitious at all. It's like there is still, you know, we have had 100 years to act. And, and again, so that's why, you know, we have net zero 2050 because let's put it in 2050. Why we don't set something for 2025 or for 2040, you know? So, the, there is no negation anymore. And in that sense, in that sense, you know, despite of all the efforts of the fossil fuels to, to deny, to doubt, to delay, they, we, and now in greenwashing, but still we know that the big majority now agrees with that diagnostic. What, where we seem to be uh, stuck is on the pace to us. Uh, accelerate the action. Um, this bill, um, be, before it leaves the Senate, will enter because it hasn't entered committee yet. And when do you anticipate it entering committee? And I, I'm, I ask, ask that question because, in terms of uh, folks here uh, listening online and taking action, what they can do. Um, when it does go to committee, I don't know if, it's, if, if it will go to, before the end of the fall or, or maybe in 2023, um, what can they do yes. uh, to, uh, to advance this in committee so that, you know, you've got, uh, you know, this, this uh, groundswell. Um, so what I can tell you is this very interesting thing that right now I am assessing. So 
the 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 bills can be uh, tabled in the Senate or, or in the House of Commons, but they follow exactly the same procedure. But it starts here or it starts there. When it finishes here, it goes to the other place and it starts the process. So we are here. It's a member, a private member bill. And so I'm not part of the government. I'm an independent senator. But people are telling me that this is very positive because when you have one party telling them, especially to the financial sector, what to do, that it's very indigestive. It's better when this an independent person that, you know, is more neutral to say this and this. So people are saying that's, that's positive. But we have, you have to remember that now the Senate, it's a different uh, Senate. It doesn't work as the previous one. We are less partisan where there is, there is no, we're independent. We're all independent, it, but we still are governed by some old rules that, for example, says that every bill needs a official opposition critic. So normally, if everything is okay, these uh, official opposition critics should be named at the moment I table a bill, it should be named the next day. I, I, I put it in last March. We still officially, we don't know who's the critic. So some um, people that sympathize with the bill and see the importance have talked already. They have already said what they they want to say, and they have already asked to send it to committee. But until we don't hear from this person, we won't be able to push it. And and so there are still some um, some political games and procedures, things that I do use to delay some some progress. And and I I am sure you 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 can guess that the fossil fuel industry doesn't like the bill, you know. But at the same time, what I answer to them, because I have talked, of course, with them too, is that I forgot to mention is that the bill is um, technology agnostic. We are not saying use this technology, don't use this technology. We are not saying that. What we are saying is we have commitments. We have signed the Paris Agreement. We have passed the Act of Net Zero 2050. So align with that. And tell me, how are you going to attain that? That's all. And, and more, moreover, is that as a senator, I cannot move a bill that move money. We, I cannot. So I have to use whatever is already there in the legislation to push for and, and on the government uh, structure to push for, for my objectives. And the objectives are clear. We have national, international commitments. I'm just asking the, financial sector to align to that. Of course, there are things that eliminating the conflict of interest, which I told you. Of course, there is the expertise that have to come to the decision. So what I want you to do, if you like this proposal, is to call your senator, not, not only your MP, but your senator, and say, we need this bill to be debated in committee, in the banking committee. So we have some people in the banking committee which wants to debate. And our first objective, to be very honest with you, was to start this conversation. Because this conversation was the elephant in the room that nobody wanted to address. Because nobody wants to touch the, the, the finance sector, you know, despite of the fact that we have lived this crisis in 2008 and we should have learn that we cannot give full responsibility of our money and our pension money uh, to the financial sector just blindly because things can happen. And similar to the COVID, climate change is an external external um, uh, factor that is causing crisis, is external. It's not like the 2008, with, which could be considered an inside job because it started with the own manipulation of the derivative uh, and the and the real estate and insurance uh, um, sector uh, that originated that crisis. So call your senator, call your MP, and say we need this bill to go to committee, get to a vote. Yeah. Thank you. Um, questions from the room. Questions uh, from online.
Okay, here we go. Thank you very much for pushing this bill. It's vital to our collective survival. In 2049, I doubt that I will be sitting in a meeting talking to anyone because I will be past my 100th birthday. Um, when you say call your senator, I certainly know who my member of parliament is, but I don't have a your senator. Should we be writing to every senator? Yeah. Every senator. Yeah. Okay, because there's no, we don't have senators anymore. Okay. So that's, I wanted to start there. And the second question I want to ask you is when we look at the impact of various things, I believe we should be doing it on a cradle to grave basis from the very digging of the soil to get out the metals to put in the batteries to the final disposal of the stuff into the junk heap when it can't be replaced. And I don't know if the bill touches on any of that cradle to grave type accounting, but I think it's important in any analysis of any technology to not just look at what it pollutes today, but from the moment of its creation and the mining of the stuff that we need to put into it. For that reason, I'm not a big supporter of electric cars. So my bicycle will do just fine. But I just, I ask about the cradle to grave because I don't know if it's mentioned anywhere and I don't hear it often enough. And I think it's important that we look at the total costs from inception through to disposal. Absolutely. Um, you're absolutely right. We have to have this holistic approach, this uh, um, view from the very bird and design at the design level. When we are designing something that we already think in things that are recyclable, reusable, repairable. Otherwise, as I said, shouldn't be in the market. Uh, in the bill, the way we address it, this is through what we request from OSFI. When we request that OSFI draws guidelines, we tell to, to OSFI to mention things that we know already. For example, sustainability. So cradle to cradle is a principle within sustainability. And, and so we know that the financial sector is thinking on sustainability because, for example, the values of ESG, which is the environment, um, social and governance, it's included in the sustainability. So all of that should be in, uh, included in that. Uh, and again, um, we cannot prescribe something. We don't want to tell them exactly how to do it. We have to leave the engine. And these things changes very fast. So maybe new technology will be developed soon. So we don't want to be restrained to some things. So we are just putting the frames and the directions. And sustainability is uh, one of the directions that the bill wants to. Do. Thank you. Uh, he said he. While you're trying to get to the person who is, uh, is there someone that wants to ask a question? In any case, I'm gonna I'm gonna intervene and ask you uh, about the banks. Um. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll uh, get in there to s squeeze in. Now you mentioned, I think, in your presentation, when you look at financial institutions uh, in total, that there are some financial institutions that are taking it seriously, and that their their action plans are are uh, you know are are aimed at uh, at uh, sustainability and and um, and and they're paying attention to the risk to themselves, but you know you had you had that sign up with the with the big five and the investments and the they, the finance they continue to um, to allocate to to the industry. So who are who are some of the financial institutions that are taking it seriously, and why is it that you know they're likely these stranded assets. That 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 are a likelihood and and will pose a risk to not only their institution but but you know their own institute not only the their institution but the entire 
uh, economy and, and why are they ignoring their financial duty, their, their fiduciary duty, sorry. Well, one of the reasons is this conflict of interest that I mentioned, you know, um, but there are other, other reasons too, is that um, they want to maximize profits. So what I, I see is that they, the, the banks are very conscious that things are changing. They, very soon, actually not very soon, it's already, we have passed the tipping point. Now renewables, wind and solar are cheaper than fossil fuels. So we are already there. And if you look at the, at the um, growth of renewables energy is, I, I, I think seven times, but this have to be validated. It, 70 is conservative. It could be bigger than that growth compared to fossil fuels. So an other thing that I can say is that renewable energy is considered deflationary because the development of renewable energy follows a learning curve, which says that the more you know, the more experience, the cheaper it gets. While fossil fuels right now, we went from conventional to unconventional, doesn't follow the learning curve, is getting more expensive and more expensive and more expensive. You have to go kilometers deep in the ocean. You have to extract oil from sands. You have to extract oil from shale, fracking. And so it costs a lot of money. So it's considered inflationary. So why you will say a bank will choose an uh, inflationary investment versus a deflationary investment? Why will do that? And the reason is because they want to maximize at the short term their their uh, profits. But there is another more local reason for Canada, which is the following. Because of the awareness of the more and more becoming stranded assets. And I'll just give you one example. Do you know that the TMX, the pipeline, that we are at the 17th insurance company because all the previous one have abandoned the project. Okay. So that's what it is telling us that people are leaving the boat. And so who's there now to stay there with the Canadian companies, the Canadian banks. So on one hand, I understand this situation. Of course, we, we want Canada, but, but the solution is not to just keep oxygenating the sector. Actually, is aligning with the commitments. So like they go into a northerly passion, accelerated pace to decarbonization to give stability to the energy sector. Instead, by delaying and delaying and delaying and, and continue, continue, they are provoking, they are increasing the risk. And that's why economists are saying that climate is a systemic risk. It's not just to the local bank, the local institution, it's, it's to everybody. And I want to say, Climate change is affecting everyone everywhere. It's not just uh, affecting Pakistan. It's affecting, yesterday it affected the Maritimes because Fiona and the new hurricanes are traveling longer and longer and longer up north. So, and then we have Bedu North in that same area that wants to construct very dangerous infrastructure that will be subject to these stronger waves, strong tides, changing temperatures, strong winds. So why this is illogical? At the end, the logic is on the money. Follow the money and then you understand why are these decisions taken. And, and what is sad is that the government should be in a position to look this from above and, and protect us. But there is this also capture. And, and, and if I hadn't lived in Europe and in Latin America, I wouldn't able to see it because then when you live in one point, it's only this what you see. And as I said earlier, in Canada, we equate 
energy with fossil fuels. But when you come and live in Quebec, we don't equate it with fossil fuels. We equate it with Hydro-Quebec. John, go ahead. Then the Okay. Yeah, well, thank you very much for the presentation. I just wanted to, uh, I'll be talking about uh, the banks a bit uh, next week in one of the presentations. Uh, I'll be speaking on postal banking, but I'm also talking about the big banks. I mean, the absurdity of corporations like the Royal Bank, which made $21 billion in profit last year, $21 billion in profit, which is about uh, far more than the whole gross domestic product of, of Jamaica and many other countries, uh, just in terms of profit. Um, I wanted to, to you to talk a bit about uh, the support or the uh, what, what, what people or in, in uh, the major political parties have said to you about this bill. Have you had contacts with them? What have they said? All the, the uh, five or six major parties we have out there. What, are, what have they said in terms of, of uh, this bill? And secondly, what about unions? Have any of the major unions, uh, uh, you know, talked about this bill and said that they would be interested in supporting it? Yes. Yes. So actually, I am in a hurry to send it to the other place because in the other place, in the House of Commons, people have officially and unofficially expressed high support for the bill. And, and uh, three of the four parties have said, to me, we are waiting for your bill to come. So they are happy. And, and this is, ref is reflected in the fact that, uh, or confirmed by the fact that the, all these big parties, except for the conservative, had in their, in their platform elements of sustainable finance. So this bill is considered within sustainable finances. And, uh, and there are elements of that in their own platforms. So, yeah, I can name the NDP, Bloc Québécois, Liberals, Greens. They have said, this is fantastic. This is good. Good job. Please, it has to come to our, to our place. Actually, yesterday, the finance, House of Commons Finance Committee was discussing exactly about this exactly about how to finance the transition. So the big question is why in the Senate, it's still a elephant in the room that nobody wants to um, touch. No, it's not, not nobody, but few. Or that, uh, you know, um, we are scared of talking about this. So, and uh, part, as I said, is the rules, how it's the rules work, but also is because, um, I, I put a motion to declare um, climate emergency in the Senate. And it was stalled, unfortunately, by the conservative. I'm still waiting. But there was, there was a similar motion in the, in, at the House of Commons that was unanimously accepted. So I think that there are political games. And, and I'm, I'm I have to be honest. I'm not a politician. I am, I come from the engineering, the university, the educational science sector. So I can be played around by politics actually very easily. And, but I'm learning. I'm learning. I learn fast. And so I still have to learn how to navigate the politics. Unions. Yes. Um, so it's, I've been going to cops for, I don't know, uh, 10 years. And every time I go, I find a way to talk with unions. So I already talked to them last year when my, they were part of the consultations. So some of the elements of uh, just transition can be found in, in there. And yes, I have their support from unions. Actually, a question online from Eileen Oleksiak, which you have pretty well responded to, but just let me just say what she asked. Thank you for this very encouraging presentation. 
Can you give us a sense of the level of support you've from uh, colleagues in the Senate? And have you spoken with political parties? And if so, what's the general reaction? I think you've pretty well answered that, but if you have any other comments. Uh, yes, so again, you know, I, I, I can exercise uh, a limited amount of pressure from inside. Um, I, I find in my six years at the Senate um, that the Senate reacts more from outside pressures. And, uh, and for that, I need your help and your assistance. And, uh, and I ask you and I beg you to, um, write to your MP and your, and the senators, all of them and, uh, and push for this because that's what will push them. Okay. We have a question from Manfred. Manfred. Yeah. Um, Senator, uh, first of all, I congratulate you on this bill, and I certainly will. Uh, it's easy to, to address all the senators these days because you can do it with, with one email. Um, uh, and I think this is definitely something going in the right direction. I'm not telling you anything new, though, that um, uh, the obstacles are, are going to be great. And I think a lot of the maneuvering that you're experiencing is because in this debate, the institutions easily agree to things so long as they remain ambiguous. And the moment it's get nailed down and uh, to, to quote the Financial Times again, uh, yesterday in the Financial Times, there was a report saying that the biggest financial institutions in the U.S., are expressing reservations and are probably going to leave the Jim Carney put together uh, because they're getting cold feet because their directors fear there could be lawsuits coming. And even though I'm, we're all on the same wavelength in terms of the objectives here, um, I have to say one has to have some sympathy. If you're sitting on a board, and you feel there's a legal liability connected to something over which you actually have very little control. Because as you say, there are so many uncertainties, new technologies, whatever, that that really raises questions about the likelihood that this could be workable, which then leads me to think there are certain institutional changes. The reason why public utilities work and have worked historically. The reason why Norway with its oil has had a completely different experience is because the oil was controlled through mechanisms where the profit motive could be balanced against other objectives in a reasonable manner, which is what happens in a public institution. It is not reasonable to expect that that will happen in the private banks that are maximizing profits. I was sitting on a pension board and I pushed very hard on the stranded assets issue. And, and all of the consulting companies that came were grilled on the stranded assets question. And they all understood this. But for them, for them, that's not actually a really big issue because the way they look at stranded assets is, okay, we know that's in the wings, but the day we think that becomes really a problem, we're going to sell those shares short and we'll make as much money from the collapse as we did in the original investment. I cannot agree more with you. Yes, you are right. That's why it's interesting when we talk to, um, I tell you two things. Um, everybody in, in the sector, in the financial sector, and I want to include uh, these three groups in the financial sector, the banks, the uh, insurance, and the um, pension plans, um, they will tell us this. They will say, we need guidance from the government because right now is the far west. Okay, so, okay, guidance from the government. And, and then there are others that will tell us the carrot can go only that far. We need a little of a stick because um, just carrot 
we know it doesn't work or it causes extremes, you know, the too greedy. And, and so therefore, I see that there is sort of a underlying consensus about that there is the role of the government to put guidelines and to tell them, you know, this is the way that we should go. And uh, hopefully, uh, more we talk, the more we talk, the more this will appear um, possible because it has been done for other things, you know? Um, for example, if we look at the, at the war or the, the recession, and if we look at the percentage of GDP that was used to solve these big, huge issues, it's very little. So we know that the money is there. Is the how and the when, and we need to find out this very quick because of the seriousness of climate change and its impact. Lawrence Cumming has a, a question, Lawrence. Hello. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Senator, for this uh, um, excellent presentation, indeed an inspiring presentation. Um, my uh, question, uh, I think, um, is prompted more by um, your professional training and experience as an environmental engineer than it is as a, uh, a senator. It may be slightly off topic, but I think it can be related back. Um, I'm wondering what you think from uh, your professional perspective about um, uh, discussion on um, um, uh, carbon uh, sequestration. Um, I'm, I'm uh, very much a skeptic on this question myself, but uh, I would appreciate your, uh, your uh, insights, whatever light you can shed on uh, that as a uh, uh, a potential solution or, or a partial solution or, uh, or not. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you very much. So you're right. Uh, I have an opinion as an engineer about carbon capture, uh, storage or utilization. And it's the following. First of all, this technology is being under development for the last 30 years. It's nothing that uh, we start developing five years ago, three years ago. It's been there for 30 years. And the maximum efficiency that has been attained is by um, companies in corporations in Norway, in Iceland, and um, one in Saskatchewan, but has never exceeded the 60%, 50%, and at very high, high cost. So that's on the technical level. On the economical level, I also can tell you that uh, we, um, if we have the money if to develop carbon capture and storage, that money should go to renewable cap capacity, increasing renewable capacity. Why it will go into lock in us on continuing on the fossil fuel? I can tell you that um, Germany um, was looking into this um, right before the um, uh, war in Ukraine. And then I, I, I was in a, in a meeting where people in Germany said the best moment for Germany to decarbonize and to went into renewables was 20 years ago when something happened in Germany. The next best moment to decarbonize, given what is happening with the Ukraine war, is now. Because they ha have concluded that what they have to search and look and seek is for energy independence. And if they continue with technologies developing, I would say, wasting money in developing carbon capture and storage, that will continue locking them with the gas and with the uh, petroleum. And just to conclude with the, the sovereignty funds. So maybe you know that the Alberta sovereign funds was inspiration to the Norway sovereign funds. It was they took the Albertan model and they applied. So they started accumulating wealth after Alberta. So today, so many years after, you ask the critical question, where are, where is Alberta with their sovereign aid funds? Where is Norway with sovereign aid funds? And Norway is paying its decarbonization with its sovereign aid funds. 
we don't have that in Canada. And it's sad, you know, because we could have um, um, we could have developed better this um, sector and uh, have refineries in Alberta so we can get more money for our oil instead of sending to uh, Louisiana and then ship it back to us because in Quebec we, we use Albertan oil after being refined in Louisiana. So these are these uh, incoherences that we we had to correct it and we didn't, but um, we cannot continue in this situation. I think, uh, unfortunately, this this session is coming to a close. It has to come to a close, and I have the sad task of ensuring that it comes to a close. I, I just, <laughs> and Roy, you might want to say a few words after about the uh, the conference going forward. I don't know, but I. I'll, I'll leave that to you, but I, I just say I, I traditionally thought of um, of the Senate as the the branch of sober second thought, and 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 you have completely turned it, my view of it upside down because you are the one that's that's pushing uh, for action. I want to thank you for an inspiring presentation and for this incredible work that you're doing. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I worked on Parliament Hill for five or six years and I can attest, attest, uh, there may be others that I'm not aware of, but I, I think the work you're doing as a senator, uh, is unprecedented. So I, I thank, um, the people here, the people online, um, you heard Senator Galvez, uh, uh, tell you about what you can do uh, to advocate for this legislation and to push senators and others in the House of Commons in the political uh, parties so, so to help move this forward and so that we can move from a situation of perpetual laggardness and inaction to one of real action and accountability. So thank you again. Let me add my thanks to uh, that of Bruce, and thank you to Bruce for moderating this final session of a very stimulating day, ending so appropriately with Senator Galvez's CAFA. And we, everyone in this room, I think, is with you in spirit. Now we have to go out and do it in action. So just a reminder about next week. Uh, we're starting on Monday with a panel that will pick up some of the issues that have been mentioned briefly, particularly in terms of currencies and exchange rates and interest rates and so forth with a panel uh, consisting of uh, two uh, experts and uh, moderated by Eric Heiner, who's also an expert in the field. Uh, and he will be, um, uh, he'll be hosting a, a panel on where does the currency system go and Matthias Pernengo and Mark Plant will be speaking to issues such as the future of the SDR the future of a U.S. dominated, U.S. dollar dominated currency system. So that's uh, in store for Monday. On Tuesday, uh, we're going to be talking about some of the issues that came up earlier uh, in terms of the public sector and the public purse and its both power and responsibility and ability to do many of the things that have been let go and delegated to the pri to the private sector through various means and and uh, uh, channels. And finally, on Wednesday, we will have our final substantive panel, uh, which will be looking at um, uh, currency, uh, uh, financial innovation through um, modes such as fintech, cryptocurrencies, and other kinds of digital innovation. So there's a, a lot to, and I forgot on, on Tuesday to mention that uh, John uh, Anderson, who's with us, is going to be one of our speakers. So we look forward to seeing everyone on Monday uh, at noon for our first of three panels. Uh, have a good weekend, everyone. Please think about what you've heard and um, get in touch with our student rapporteurs if, if you have suggestions as to how we can characterize uh, today's proceedings. And 
Yeah, uh, thank you for coming and thanks for everyone's participation. And thank you again to Senator Calvin.